All right, good evening, everyone. And welcome back to our School of the Prophets. We want to give a very special welcome to all of our live viewers today. And we ask that you continue to pray with us because we know that the enemy is seeking very diligently to shut the Lord's work down. We were just experiencing a couple of technical difficulties, but by God's grace, we are back and running. And we are happy that we're going to continue in the Lord's work today. Now, we want to encourage all of our viewers to continue to share uh, these videos with their family and friends and their loved ones, because I believe that we're living in a time now where the church is hungering for present truth. And if there's ever a time where the people of God need to be coming together to study present truth, it is now, especially in this midnight watch, as we have seen. So before we pray and hand it over to um, God's manservant, Pastor Koku, we want to just outline a couple of announcements uh, this coming Sunday, Brother Michael will be starting his class, his section in, in, in the School of the Prophets entitled The Mystery of Godliness. And he's asking everyone to read the book Christian Character Perfection, specifically the chapter entitled God Manifest in the Flesh in preparation for his class. And th that book can be found in the Google Drive, both in the PDF and the audio book. So the book is called Christian Character Perfection, and the chapter he wants everyone to read is entitled, God Manifests in the Flesh. And he wants also everyone to consider all the readings in the syllabus because all of them uh, work hand in hand. Also, next Thursday, Pastor Koku will be having his last class. And then after that, we're going on a two-week break. So the week starting with August 7th and then August 14th, those two weeks we're going to be off. And then we're going to resume our studies on the 21st, but the Michael will resume his section on August 21st and then continue on August 25th that Thursday. So the 21st will be the Sunday that we resume and then August 25th, the Thursday, where Brother Mike will do his last class. And then the 28th will be a panel discussion with Brother Paul, Pastor Koko, Brother Michael and myself, a panel discussion. Um, and also we want everyone who is who wants to send in their testimonies through a video to have that in no later than August 23rd so that we can show it on the screen for everyone to see. And so we want to continue to pray for these sessions because I, be I believe that the Lord has not only been uh, blessing us but richly blessing us. When we were putting this school together, we had a lot of dreams and aspirations, but I believe that the Lord has superseded anything that we could possibly have thought of. So at this moment, we want to kneel for a word of prayer before Pastor Koku comes up. Gracious Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for bringing us out here once again to study your word. We thank you for your love, your mercy, and your grace, and all that you've been doing with us throughout this past week. And we ask that in a very special way, you will pour out your Holy Spirit's blessing upon us tonight. Father, last week, Pastor Koku started um, his section by giving us a, a very detailed understanding and significance of the heavenly sanctuary. And so today we believe that you're going to speak through your manservant once again to further elaborate on this all-important doctrine. And so we're asking, O oh God, that all of us who are um, watching live, all of us who are here physically, will, will pay very close attention. The enemy has already sought to destroy us, to take us down. But Father, help us understand that he is an already defeated foe. So we ask, Father, that you help us to be focused, help us to be in tuned, and we pray that um, your Holy Spirit will continue to enlighten us with present truth. In Jesus' name I pray with thanksgiving. Amen. Amen. Now it's on. Okay. You need a fan? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I can go now. We uh, want to thank God because a few minutes ago we could not operate because uh, we are having some um, electronic problem. Last time we saw with uh, the heavenly sanctuary and we proved 
that that is a special and specific message God has a calling Adventist church for to share with the world and for with other churches. And uh, <clears throat> in the book Testimony to Church, Volume 5, page 455, paragraph 2, it says that God has called us at these last days, first, from the world, to be separated from the world, and second, to be separated from other churches, So he separated us from the world, then from the churches, and he gave us the three angel message so that we can go and share with them. So it is a special call. It's a special duty for a special time. Today, before we continue, let us pray. Our God, we want to thank you for giving us this uh, opportunity to look into the revelation of your mystery. Open our mind, Lord. Illuminate our understanding and help us to grasp the truth and send out the power of the Holy Spirit to enable us to take a decision to live according to your will. Cleanse us, Father, and restrain every power every attack of the enemy keep every work of the enemy in check and let only the very effective presence of the holy spirit be our share in the precious name of jesus christ we pray amen <coughs> today the title will be live the living sanctuary the oneness with Christ in his heavenly sanctuary ministration. If we get the title right, then we get the whole message. In the Old Testament, we have a figure, the shadow. And that represents the whole faith of the Jew. From Genesis to Malachi, everything was around the earthly sanctuary administration. And we laid down last time all the seven steps of the earthly sanctuary administration. We remember? Number one is Passover, second, unleavened bread, third, first fruit, fourth, Pentecost, or the feast of the weeks, fifth, trumpet, and the sixth, atonement, seven, tabernacle. So when Christ came, he came to fulfill all the seven. And after he's fulfilling all the seven, he laid down all the seven paths. How many paths? Seven, seven paths from earth onto the throne of God. And if you look at the book of Revelation 3, verse 21 to 22, Christ promised that he that will overcome will sit with him as he will serve with his father, where? At the throne. So our final destination is the throne of God. So today we will be looking at how God will do the very work within the Christian through his mind. Are you getting the point? So it's no longer any physical sanctuary. It becomes you as the sanctuary of God. And all the seven steps needed to be fulfilled in you. All of them. Because the seven steps represent the major seven steps of the plan of salvation. And salvation is not done outside of man. It is done in us. So the, son, the seven steps must be realized in our life. Are we getting the parallel very well? And uh, we will get into it very quickly. Last time, we explained the basic to understand the sanctuary. We look at the condition of eternal life as a sinlessness plus perfect, mature, developed character. Why? Because Adam and Eve was a sinless. 
They was perfect, but their character is not yet developed through obedience. That's why they fall. When God created the holy angel, the same as Adam and Eve, he placed them upon probation. Give them time to develop character. God created them. They don't choose to exist. Now God gave them the choice if they will love to continue to live or to return to non-existence. And that time is called probationary time. And God expects them to submit and he will do this work of developing character. Character is not transferable. You can't transfer character. And you can change it. It needed to be formed. We remember last week? Character needed to be formed. You can't give it to somebody. Now, <clears throat> in the plan of salvation, we need to get to look at things in a very wide spectrum. From the beginning to the end. Before God creates, he set up the plan of salvation. How he will save anyone that will choose sin. We read that in the book of um, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18 to 20. It says, <clears throat> For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things, as a silver and gold from your vain conversation, received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of the lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was a manifest in these days, in this last time for you. So Christ was foreordained before creation. We can look at the same thing in Matthew 25, Matthew 25, verse 34. It says this, Matthew 25, verse 34. Then shall the kingdom, shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, and inherit the kingdom prepared for you from when? From the foundation of the world. So God, before he creates, he prepared the plan of salvation. He prepared the kingdom. Then he chose to, to create. Why? He knew in his omniscience that the angel will sin and Adam and Eve will sin. You and me will be in sin. So the plan of salvation is not the afterthought. It's something God has set up for us. It's already done on the side of God. And now God is revealing to us what he's, done, he's doing. No, what he has done. Now he revealed it to us. When we comply and believe, he will fulfill it in every one of us. And this will be fulfilled in the Christian, in the believer. Are we getting the point? So, God is revealing something. He chose to start with a teaching moral. The Old Testament have the earthly sanctuary. And that earthly sanctuary is a teaching moral to reveal to man how he's operating. And when we get more understanding, Christ came to fulfill the same thing. Now, it's a brother, God said, okay, I want to fulfill the very thing within you, the Christian. That's why the title is, The Living Sanctuary. Meaning, if I finish to follow this study, I must expect God to, to finish, to start and finish all the seven steps in me. So the sanctuary is no longer the book. It's no longer something you will read somewhere. It's going on right here in you. Are you ready? And I encourage everybody to be in prayer so God will help us to understand. And what is the goal of all of this? To help us to reach sinlessness, victory over sin, plus perfect, mature, developed character. It's extremely important to emphasize on this point. We are many just stop on the teaching on the victory over sin. It's not enough. Why? The problem is not sinlessness. The angel was sinless. Lucifer was sinless, but he still fall. The holy angel was sinless, they still fall. Adam and Eve before sin was sinless, have a perfect character, still fall. So what we need in salvation to secure the whole universe, we need sinlessness 
plus perfect, mature, developed character through obedience. Then we will be locked in our choice to obey God unto death. Are we getting the point right? So, what we will be expecting God to do for us is a sinlessness plus perfect, mature, developed character. We are many, we just believe Christ died on the cross for us. Everything is done. We are happy. We are saved. But it's not finished. You need a perfect, mature, developed character through obedience. And that must be formed. The character must be formed. It cannot be given. It cannot be transferred. It must be formed by the power of the Holy Spirit working with you as long as you submit. And this is the point we are missing a lot. Now, next thing we, got, we need to look at it again, what causes sin? The misapprehension of the character of God. So if you know the cause, then you can know how to reverse the problem. So in this sanctuary ministration, we must expect God to reveal himself, not only unto us, but within us in the fullness. It's 100% the mysterious work. Is taking the infinite element of the very life of God and put it in a man and blend it and make a new man. It's 100% new. And A.T. John called that the new man. It's a mean, simply mean partaking divine nature. You can make it. You can try it. You have to believe it. It will be done unto you. You see, what I like with God is He's doing everything with infinite power. Okay? He's doing everything with infinite power. Meaning, it is just more than possible. But he can't force it. He just needs to reveal to us what he's doing. We believe it and he do it. So, we will be expecting sinlessness plus perfect, mature, developed character. And this comes from where? Through obedience, Right? Now, that obedience should not come from fear. It must come from love. Amen. And we must obey God by faith. And that faith must work by love. Right. And we must overcome by the faith of Jesus. Amen. That must work by the love of Jesus, Amen. which is the love of God. Mm-hmm. And the love of God you can have in need to be given to you. Mm-hmm. So, in this study, we know where we are going. We know what we are expecting God to do in us. Develop character in me. Through obedience. I can't obey by myself. I need the power of the Holy Spirit. But I can also obey from fear. Like which is the three angel message. This is the hour of his judgment. Obey God or the wrath of God without mixture will fall upon you. Everybody run to God in fear. That is the gospel of the papacy. And that will be the last message they will be preaching. Everybody worship God or we will kill you. But God wants us to know, to see, to behold the cross, to see that God himself, through his son, is paying for our price. And when you behold that, you say, Lord, I surrender. It becomes, the obedience is based on love, on confidence, and joy. And when Paul, when Paul understands this very well, when he understands the love of God, he can say nothing will separate him from the love of God. I'm asking myself, how, what did he understand so much that he's ready to die? He's ready to face persecution, hunger, no matter what is it. And Paul even said, if even the angel come to tell him anything, he's not going to let the, the love of God go. Can we see how precious the love of God become for Paul? How much that love is, is precious for you? Are you satisfied with the love of God? Otherwise, nothing else can satisfy you on this planet. So when Paul understood very well, we remember last time I spoke about the book of Hebrew. He dedicated the whole book of Hebrew to explain the heavenly sanctuary to the Jew. So when Paul behold God in the sanctuary and allow God to fulfill all of that in him, he become one with the love of God. So he really not only have intellectual knowledge, but he's fellowshipping with his mystery. The fellowship of the mystery of God, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 9 to 11. God has made a provision. Not only that we will be looking at his glory, but he's sharing it with us. That's why when everything will be finished, 
we will have the uncreated life of God reproduced in us. And we will be placed above the holy angel. This is 100% the work of God. And do not tell me it cannot be done. It cannot be done by you. Not by me. But it is already done by God because he prepared a kingdom. He set up the plan of salvation before he created. So let us pause and get the picture of why. You are stepping in something. And God is telling you, before he creates, he prepared the plan of salvation. So people will be saved through that plan of salvation. When they, when they are saved, where are you going to put them? Okay, he prepared a kingdom also. So he get everything ready. Now, when we fall in sin, God come with the plan. Say, this is what I have planned before. We should enter in this plan with 100% confidence. Because God is not seeking to make it. He get it done orderly. Now he wants to work with us to get us there. Amen. Are we together? Amen. Why God cannot force salvation? When I was in the world, the church was the, the very awful place you could be. Can you take somebody from right now, from any, any uh, what do you call it, uh, club, and they want to force him to sit down here and listen to this message? Instead of listening to his message and dancing, it will be a punishment to him. If you don't love the holiness of God, if you don't love to share his holiness, his selflessness, heaven will be a prison to you. And God cannot put that on you for eternity. Are we getting the point? It's not God refusing people to be saved. Because God can say, he can't feel good to keep somebody somewhere he don't want to. Are we getting the point? That's why we need to know what God laid down, and we must know it is for us. The plan of salvation is made for for us. What is going on? We will look at uh, how... God will do the thing. We say that we must expect God to fulfill everything in us, right? How he will do it? Look at this. The brain, nerve, which communicate with the entire system are the what? The only medium. There's no other way. The only medium through which heaven can communicate to man and affect. He's the inmost life. Are we getting the point? So it will be only through our mind that God will affect our life, change our make us grow in character until we reach the perfection and be sealed. Everything will be done through what? The mind. What is the mind? The mind is the functioning principle of your brain. If you close your eyes right now and somebody point the gun on you, you're not going to feel anything. You're okay. But when you open your eyes and you see God on you, it changes everything. Because you process that through your mind, now you are afraid. Are we getting the point? So that's how the mind functions. If you don't put any information in it, it's not working. So you need information so it can work. So the word of God is a given information to the mind. And the mind will process that. Then in that process, it says it's, a, it's the only medium of what? Of communication. So God give you a mind. He give you a message. Now you, ask, you understand and believe the message. And now when you believe it, you claim it and he fulfill it for you. So what Satan is doing today is to fill up people's mind with a lot of garbage. Wrong doctrine, heresy, everything. So that you cannot claim anything. And when Stephen understood this very well, when the people were stoning him, he was looking at them. No, he was looking up, and heaven was open, and God was assisting him. The Bible says, Acts 7, verse 55, says, he was filled with the Holy Spirit. So can you see God in heaven, walking through Christ, through the holy angel, unto man on earth, and perfecting his character so much that even when people were stoning him, only one life was revealed, the very life of Christ. Yeah, amen. So you can see the whole sanctuary at work right there in the man. 
And this is the purpose. And this is the only goal of Christian life. If you miss it, you become a very good church member. But you never have any fellowship with the mystery of God. We are many today. I always tell the people, if the church disfellowship you for anything, and you lose your faith, that means you did not believe in God, you did believe in the church. Yeah, when you believe in them, they fire you, then you are lost. But if you believe in God, he can die, he can give up on his patient, and he's only there to save you, you will return right back to him, you don't care about what people will say. You don't encourage sin, you don't love it, but when you fall, you say, Lord, I fall, deliver me. The only medium. Now start asking yourself right now, what are you processing through your mind? When you are alone, are you processing through your mind every evil thought or every good thought? Everything is going on right here. We remember Christ? He says sin is conceived in, in the mind. If sin is conceived in the mind, then where did we fight sin? Right there in the mind. Now I say, now, you say heaven must begin on earth. For every soul who will enter the heavenly mansion above. We are many waiting for Christ to come to save us. There's no Bible verse like that. We know that, right? Christ is not coming to save people. He's coming to take with himself those who are saved. That's why every Christian must go through all the seven steps. And they get into the experience of the tabernacle. And what is the tabernacle? It's salvation. It's a victory. You know, just after the day of atonement, you know the sin is forgiven. The sanctuary is cleansed. Every sin transferred on the scapegoat. The whole nation is free of sin. Now you have a big feast. It's a, a rejoicing. And every Christian must get into the experience of the tabernacle where? On earth. And where that will happen? Right here in the mind. We will look at this. He said this. Unless the mind of God become the mind of man, every effort to purify himself will be useless, for it is impossible to elevate man except through a knowledge of God. You remember John 17 verse 3? This is life eternal. To know you. We are many people. We don't want to know anything about God. And what we know on him is just false. It's just wrong. Let us look at this again a little bit. Unless the mind of God become the mind of man. Unless the mind of God become the mind of man. Every effort to purify himself will be useless. For it is impossible to elevate man except through a knowledge of God. Now, how, what is the mind of God and how do we get the mind of God? We know that Christ came to reveal to us the Father and everything about the Father. That if I want to know the mind of God, all I need to know is to know the mind of Christ. So let me go to Philippians chapter 2, quickly, verse 5 to 8. It says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. But made himself of no reputation. That is number one. He said, willingly, joyfully making yourself of no reputation. Two, so, and he took upon himself the form of servant of what? Servants. So, number one was what? No repetition. Number two, form of servant. Three, and it was made unto the likeness of man. He humbled himself down, down to our level. The lowest possible. 
Continue. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself. So humbling yourself. You see, it's very clear. It doesn't say he was humbled. No, it's humbled himself. He chose willingly to be submit. And become obedient. So obedience must be part of the mind of Christ. Obedience. Now, which kind of obedience? Obedience unto death, even the death of the cross. The most humiliating death possible. The good news is, God did not ask you to make that mind. He said, be, let be. You see, when God said, let light be, the light, it, it, what, the word of God, you see, the word of God have in itself the power to fulfill what it says. Amen. All the tree we can see out there, everything we can see, that is the word of God made alive. That is the substance of the word of God. So when God told, when Christ told the paralytic, raise, take your bed and walk. When the man processed that word through his mind, he believed it. He accepted it. Or remarkably, what happened? When he accepted that, the power of God back up the word and fulfill what he says. So when you believe that God can make you perfect, you're not trying to make yourself perfect. You just believe that he is God, and whatever he says goes, and I believe it. And that is his business. The word of God. Now, we look at this mind very well. No reputation, being a servant, humble himself, become obedience unto death. All of that constitute the mind of, of God, who is the mind of Christ. Now let's look at our quotation again. Unless the mind of God become the mind of man, every effort, meaning you can be fasting and praying like the Pharisees, right? You can be doing everything. You can be present through, preacher, everything. If you don't get this mind, you're not going anywhere. The good news is God did not ask you to make it. He is saying, let me do it. Mm -hmm. Why? We remember what we said? That God set up the plan of salvation before creation, and he set up the kingdom before he created. Right. I mean, all is done, we just need to know and comply. First Corinthians 2, verse 16. First Corinthians Chapter 2, verse 16, it says, For who had known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. We do have what? The mind, the mind of Christ. How do we get that? There is a formula we need to get right. James chapter 4. James chapter 4, verse 7, says this. Many people will say, resist the devil and he will flee away from you, right? There's no Bible verse like that. The verse says very well, submit yourself therefore to God, resist the devil and he will flee from you. The key is that mind of submission. We remember that we should not obey God from fear, but from love. So it's a willing submission. In the submission, we become one. You look at how Mary, everything was fulfilled unto Mary. The angel brought the word of God. And finally, she accepts. As soon as she submits and accepts the word of God, now God will fulfill it. If Mary has said no, God will find another version to do the work. All God is telling to you and me is to conceive a new person in us. And that person is Jesus in me. Amen. The same, look, listen carefully, the same way Christ was formed in Mary, the same way Christ will be formed in you. In Mary there was her flesh, the sinful egg of Mary, brought the spirit of God, you blend it, you have a new man, human divine Jesus Christ. Amen. When we submit our mind to the Lord, 
the Holy Spirit infuse the mind and bring the life of God and blend it and we become human divine being. And that is the purpose of the sanctuary study. Unless the mind of God become the mind of man. That is the key. I want us to really, really sit there until we get it right. Because this will bring a war in our mind. A what? A war. There will be what you want and what the Lord wants. What you want will be so pulling. And what the Lord wants will be also there. And you will be making the decision. How this function. God willing, I have a whole presentation only on that for the third presentation. How this function. I will give one or two experience. You remember Job? Satan was hurting the flesh of Job. To do what? To submit his mind, to quest God, to disobey God. At the same time, God through the Holy Spirit was working through the mind of Job to submit all the claim of the flesh. The battle is going all where? Right there. The victory of overseas going nowhere? Right there. Character development through obedience going nowhere? Right there. Everything is going on in him. The whole sanctuary ministration is going on in him. What is the purpose of the high priest? Is to clean the sanctuary and clean the people out there. Because on this day of atonement, we need our sin to be brought out from our mind. Character to be developed. We have to be sealed. All of those things going on, but it has to be done where? Right here. So, when Mo, uh, Job going through the trial, and he must have the victory, he understood the law of the fellowship of the mystery. So he fully submitted God. So it was God, through Christ, through the Holy Spirit, in him, keeping him from falling, keeping all the claim of the flesh down, now sin, through Satan, hurting the flesh, getting him sick, try to control the mind. Are you getting the point? Right. This is the purpose of persecution. Mm. When Sunday law comes, every Christian, true Christian, must go through that experience. Are you getting my point? This is the only way of victory. We must learn to allow God to be alive and working and functioning in our mind. It's the only way to keep up from sinning. And Stephen did the same thing. He understood the principle. The people was hurting him. He was feeling all the pain, but he did not pay attention to that because he knew if he disconnect from heaven, he will fall. So Satan is pushing the persecution to do what? Just to push until you divest your mind from Christ, then he will kill you in your sin and you get lost anyway. That we need to know God is functioning with infinite wisdom. How much of wisdom? Infinite, infinite wisdom. And how much of power? infinite power. So let us see what, should, what God will actually do in us. Uh-huh. Something happened right here, but it's okay. All right. We remember that this first part is for the earthly sanctuary. The second one, Christ came to fulfill them. Everyone have the handouts, and those who are watching on the line, you just, you know, get it. Now, I'm going to run through this quickly. Now, before we go there, I want to recap a little bit how Christ fulfilled the seventh step. I talked about it last time, but I want to recap before I move forward. When Christ came, he came to fulfill all the seven steps. First Corinthians 5, verse 7, Christ said, the Bible says, Christ is what? Our Passover. That is Paul. So writing to the Gentile, he makes sure he gives them the heavenly sanctuary straight. You get the point? Paul makes sure he writing to the Corinthians who are pagan. He gave them straight the gospel of Christ in the sanctuary, right away. When he wrote the book of Hebrew to the Jew, he made sure only Christ in the, the heavenly sanctuary. 
How do we study the Bible? We never get heavenly sanctuary in it. Verse 8, Christ is our what? Our own living bread of sincerity and truth. Now, when we continue, we look at uh, I need to come right back. At the first fruit, the first fruit is the resurrection of Christ. And we look at that in the first Corinthians 15, verse 20 to 23. Christ is the first fruit of those who are, who are, who will be resurrected and who are already resurrected. In the, in his resurrection, we can see that some people also resurrect in Matthew 27, verse 51 to 54. Now, in the Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, verse 32 to 33, what happened? When the Christ received the announcement of the Holy Spirit according to the promise of God, the disciples also received the same thing on earth. The first trumpet, destruction of Jerusalem. When the angel who was on charge how to take only the fire from the altar of incense, last time I explained that that altar is called altar of incense, meaning it must be always be made with incense. And the incense is the grace of God, the forgiveness, the reconciliation, everything to save the sinner. Is that incense add to our prayer, make our prayer acceptable. So that, that in institution is always grace to, to uh, uh, make void, okay, the consequence of our sin. Until we say, no, Lord, I want to face that myself. And God says, really, you want to face it yourself? Okay, I keep the incense. That is the grace. So when he keeps the incense now, what will be given to you? Only fire. So it's not any arbitrary work of God. But it's a choice of men God is respecting. So in the destruction of Jerusalem, there was an angel on charge taking that fire and scattering the fire. It is a figure. We know that in the sanctuary, everything is a symbol. So that simply means Israel is protected by the holy angel. When you reject the grace of God, you are also asking God, take away your protection. And God said to the angel, step back. As soon as they step back, the evil angel step in. And everything is marked up. You will read this in the Great Controversy, page 28 to 36. Everything is right there. Or you read the whole chapter, chapter 1, Destruction of Jerusalem. Now, after that, after the trumpet, we have what? Atonement. And that atonement is the end of the 2300 prophecy. And we already studied that with uh, our brother Paul, so we're not going over there again. And we prove the day of atonement last time. We remember? And we, we proved that the book of Hebrew gave us a lot of information on that. The 2300 prophecy gave us a lot of information on it. The seven churches study. Let us know that Philadelphia have what? Open door. That is the door open from the holy to the most holy. So we have all the proof. Now, today our goal is to get into the living sanctuary, right? In that living sanctuary, we will be looking at some verse. Let's go quickly to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5, verse 24. Galatians chapter 5, verse 24, it says, Which things are allegory, for these are two covenants, the one from the Mount of Sinai, with which gendered to bondage, which is eager. I don't want to go too deep in that verse, but it's revealing to us that God is no longer in the work of self, but he's in the work of him, his own work in the man. How is his work in the man? Galatians 2, verse 20. In Galatians 2, verse 20, he said, I am what? Crucified with Christ. How do we call the crucifixion of Christ? Passover. So if you are crucified with Christ, you are having what? The experience of Passover in your life. We remember very well that everything God will fulfill in us. 
So we are crucified with Christ. That is our Passover. He said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, not, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So the man is dead. The life he has in him is the life of Christ. The faith he exercised is the faith of Jesus. And we know very well, we will overcome only with what? The faith of Jesus. Not the faith for Jesus. It's so those who keep the commandment of God and have the faith of Jesus. It simply means the very mind of Christ that fully trusts the Father and surrender in obedience unto death. Christ, our Passover. Now, we experience, Paul experienced the Passover, the unliving bread. When we look at uh, 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 7, verse 8, 1 Corinthians 7, verse 8, 1 Corinthians 5, verse 8, sorry. 5, verse 8 says, Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, Neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness. That means if I have a malice in me, if I have a wickedness in me, I know I have a leaven in me. He continues, but with the what? The unleavened bread of what? Sincerity and truth. You got to be sincere. You got to be walking in the truth. Are you believing everything that sounds good? Or because the pastor says that it's the word of God. Or did you reach the level where you are so communing with God? And when you read something, the Holy Spirit will testify it is true before you accept it. Can we function in a heresy and finish the work? No. Can we be learning from Babylon to finish the work? No, May God help us. Now, Passover. We finished. Unleavened bread. We can, we see that now first fruit. In the first fruit, we can go straight back to Galatians two. He said, "I am crucified with Christ, right? And the life I live now is the life of Christ. Between death and life, what happened? Resurrection. resurrection. And how do we call it resurrection? First fruit. Okay." What is the meaning of first fruit? Let us make it easy. God, we know that at the end, Christ is coming with the, the circle in his hand. To do what? To harvest. Now, when the farmer is getting his land ready, did he have a harvest? No, he's hoping. He got everything ready and he saw the seed. He's still hoping because if you don't have any rain, any sun, everything is going to be dry up. You're still hoping. You don't have any assurance. You are hoping, you are hoping, you are hoping until that day. You go there, you can see some crops already mature. You know, the, 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 the farm is not always everything mature at the same time. Some grow first. So when you harvest that, are you doubting again? Are you hoping again? You are sure of what? Of the harvest. So when the Christ resurrects, not only himself is resurrected, Matthew 25, verse 51 to 54, let us know that the body of the saint, you can look at that for yourself, the body of the saint also come out of the grave. Why? Because God is saying, Christ is saying, here is the first fruit of my work. That's why when Mary wants to touch Christ, he said, no, let me go and present the first fruit of the work of salvation I'm doing to, to make it accept by the Father before I come down. So when Christ went to heaven, to show to the Father the sacrifice was accepted and the first fruit is right here. What does that mean to whole mankind? What does that mean to the angel? The harvest is certain. Amen. So when I choose to be a Christian, I am not dealing with probability. I am doing, I'm not dealing with maybe. I know there's the first fruit that will be harvest. Amen. And God made a way. All I do is say, Lord, this is not about anything. It's true. I accept it. Here am I. Save me. You know why? The plan of salvation is made for us. 
get the point right. It is made for us. Do you think God can stop doing what he has to do to save you? Do you think something, even your sin, do you think your sin can discourage God from saving you? No, it cannot. Our sin, let me repeat that again. We are many people, we are discouraged by our own sin. I want you to know, your sin you think is too dirty, it's too bad, it cannot discourage God from saving you. Just surrender. Just surrender. Because he knew that we will fall. He knew we cannot cleanse ourselves. Never believe that you need to be pure before you go to God. It's the deadly heresy. Never tell to yourself, oh, I, don't, I, I don't feel, I, I don't, I'm not okay. You know, I, I, I can't partake the communion service because I'm feeling so dirty. And I always ask people, if you feel so dirty, you don't want to partake the communion. Are you going to Satan to cleanse you before you come back? The work of Christ is to cleanse you. Go to him. How dirty you are. He is there for you. He's only there for you. He died only for that. He's the most holy place only for that. Now, can you see something real going on here? Let's go to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, verse 32 to 34. Somebody read it for us quickly, please. Because I want us to look at that text closely. Yeah. Acts chapter 2, verses 32 to 34. Verse 32 says, This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we all are witnesses. Verse 33. Mm -hmm. Therefore, being by the right hand of God, mm -hmm. exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he hath shed forth this, which ye now see and hear. Okay. Get the picture very well. Who promised the Holy Spirit? Jesus. No. Who promised the Holy Spirit? The Father. Father. To who? Jesus. To the Son. Jesus. Now, when he received it, what was next thing to happen? Jesus. He shared, he spread that on them. Now, get the point right. When the angel Gabriel was sent to resurrect Christ, after Christ's resurrection, what was next? The body of the saint must come out. Why? They are part of his body. What I'm trying that we can see right here is everything Christ is doing, it must happen in you. And we said that our mind, the mind is the only medium. It's the only medium we are connect to Christ that he can be fulfilling those things in us by faith. So you can behold the principle very well. That Christ died, anyone who submits will experience the same death of self. When you come out with the new life of unliving bread, the pure, perfect, mature, developed character of Christ is given to us for free. We will experience sincerity and the love of truth. After that, we must experience the first fruit. And the first fruit, Paul put it in another language, we'll look at that very soon. In Acts chapter 2, verse 32 to 33, if a, a great principle here is explained, and this principle is called the circle of beneficence. When God announced the Son, it come from the Son to the disciple. And what was the, 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 the result? The result is they give back to God what? The act of praise and a, a joyous service. So when Christ is doing everything for you, it's done in you, now it must be reflected in the Christian character. It must be reflected in the service unto God. It must be reflected in the fruit of the Spirit. That no Christian can just sit down, say, I don't know what to do. I don't have any position in the church. When you are for the position of the church, you belong to church. But if you, have, if, if you are doing the appointed duty by God according to the the gift of the spirit he have given you you are operating in the sanctuary of heaven Amen. so in fact 
the disciple was on earth, but they are what? Connected to heaven. They are connected to heaven. They are praying in the heavenly sanctuary. Are you getting the point? They are worshiping God where? In the heavenly sanctuary. That's why the last church it doesn't have a name. It's a number, 144,000. It's not a denomination. It doesn't have any name. It's a number. A very symbolic though. Okay, I don't want to go there right now. I want us to ask ourselves one question. Did we ever get into this connection with God and experiencing the very thing he is doing? Can you take the picture that Christ resurrected from the dead and some of the martyrs, those who die in him, also resurrect? Can you see the picture that Christ announced? Also the disciples on earth who are cooperating with him also receive the same announcing. That is Pentecost. After that we have what? Trumpet, the destruction of Jerusalem. Decisions made in heaven, on earth. All the Christians left by AD 66. And the destructions come AD 70. 70 AD. We can see it is a very sure word of God, of prophecy. It's a very sure path. Anyone who takes that path cannot be lost. So after the trumpet, what do you have? Atonement. Today the great question is, how much am I experiencing atonement in my life? It's just I know about it. It's just I understand how I can change. Or I am really connect and experiencing atonement. That is the point we will be looking at. And when we are missing that, we are not a Christian. Before we continue, let's look at Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Verse 11. Romans 8, 11 says, But if the spirit of him that raised up Christ from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal body by his spirit that dwell in you. So God has made a provision that everyone must experience resurrection. You see, the, the Paul is a very specific. He doesn't say you will be quickened by the Spirit. He makes a very accurate declaration. The Spirit that raised Christ from the dead. When Christ resurrected, those who are resurrected with him, which Spirit walk with them? The very Spirit that raised Christ from the dead. Walk in them and bring them back also to life. Now Paul is saying that the same Spirit must effectively walk in every true believer. Are you allowing God to do all of that for you? So after resurrection, what is next? After first fruit, we have Pentecost. Pentecost is what? Announcing of the Holy Spirit. And God made a provision that we should be all announced by the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. After you receive the Holy Spirit, you must go through trial, trial of cleanse. You got to be cleansed from self. Mm -hmm. That's you see when the disciples received the Pentecost, they start working for God. And what was the, the next stop? Persecution. It was so severe, but they remained firm. They, you see the same Paul, Peter, who denied Christ, now he can stand. And he was even crucified upside down. And he accepts. Before, he ran away. But now, he accepts. Why? It's not him living. Hello? It's not him living. It's 100% mysterious. You see, when people are possessed by a demon, they don't act according to what they really want. They are controlled by the demon. 
It is something similar. I don't say the same thing. It's the power of God walking in man and bringing the element of divine in us and reproducing the very things of God, the attribute of God, the love of God, all of God in us. Amen. And this path is called walking with God. You remember somebody in the Bible? Enoch? Yes. So the first step, I must die. What does it mean? I must believe that I am a dead walking around. I must believe that I need life. Then I surrender. That surrender is called death to self. That is a crucifixion. In that crucifixion, we want to notice this. If I give you the cross and the nail and the hammer, you cannot crucify yourself. You need somebody to crucify you. That the death of self, you can't do it by yourself. It's impossible. You allow God to do it for you. After you are now dead, the next thing is life to come. And that life is the life of Christ. It's a life of sincerity and truth. It's called unliving bread. When you come into life, that resurrection experience, that is the first fruit. It's the first fruit. It's like the down payment for your salvation. So you will grow. And when you start growing, you will, you will, need, you will need the goal tried by fire. What is that? The trials to cleanse us from self, from trusting ourselves. We need a trial as well we need a grace. Hello? Or if I want to say it well, trial is part of grace to cleanse us. Because God cannot purify the gold without fire. He cannot. Even a cry, we remember the last presentation? He was made who a perfect do thing he suffered. It must be through suffering. But God made a provision to be with you in that suffering. Is that why it's called the work with God? You are not left alone to do it. The trumpet, that is the trial we just talked about. The next will be, <clears throat> we can read that right now. We are running. Atonement. We will spend most of the time here in the close. In the atonement, the major part of it will be for the next presentation. But I want us to look at something right here. This is step number six. If you don't experience step number one, you're not coming here. You don't, expect, you don't experience step number two, you're not still not coming. Those steps must be respected. It's a strongly fixed principles. On this day of atonement, we could not just come to God and say, Lord, just cleanse me. Lord, make me perfect. No. you got to really surrender that to self. you got to stop trusting yourself. You need to stop trying to fix your life. We are many people. We want to guarantee the future. Why? We don't want to depend on God. Let me tell you, anytime you want to guarantee your future, you want to do this, do that, try by yourself to provide for the future. Somewhat you are trusting yourself. I don't say that we should be lazy. No. We must be working because we have to work. Not because we're trying to take care of the future. Are we getting the point? You can save a lot for tomorrow. Maybe tonight you're dead. Then what happened? You are dying with the faith in yourself. You can't be, you can't, you can't be raised up. You just cannot. You cannot. Because your trust was not in God. Your trust is in yourself to provide for tomorrow. So the full distrust of self is extremely important. In a life decision, taking a decision for job, for marriage, for anything, can you depend on yourself to do it? You know self is at work in your life. When you go on your, in your prayer to pray, are you going there to ask what you want? Or are you going to ask what God has already provided for you? We are moving on the principle of self. And without that, without the death of that self, there will be no resurrection. 
Can you have resurrection without death? No, sir. Can you make it happen? No, Why we are many, we don't want to die. But we want resurrection anyway. Oh yeah, we are many people, we want to be resurrected. Christian, new life. But you want to die to say, no. You want new life in Christ? Yes. How can you mix the dead and the living like that? It can't work. We want the Holy Spirit in the same thing. How many times we pray in our churches for the, for the little rain? We pray and fight for the little rain. Where is it? Yes, the little rain is falling in a little drops. But we as individuals and as a church, we must experience self-denial. It is the way of the way of the Lord. We can't pass by. Self-denial is expressed in depending on God in prayer. And we will look at that. That prayer is the only ordained, is the heavenly ordained mean of success. Of success in the conflict with sin and development of Christian character. You found this in uh, Act of Apostle, page 564, paragraph 1. The atonement, we will experience our personal letter reign. It will bring the Holy Spirit. But before we get that letter reign, we must be experiencing the daily reign. Because when the rain comes, it makes the flock, the, the crops grow. So every day reception of the Holy Spirit is for the spiritual growth. You remember our goal is to reach what? Perfect, mature, developed character. Now, if you look at John, John chapter 1 John 4 verse 7, we are born of God. We receive the love of God by birth. How do we receive the love of God? By birth. By birth. Now, when we are born, now we are growing. Romans 5.5 5 is the Holy Spirit always bringing the love of God in the heart. Why? We live by the love of God. When we grow onto the perfect, mature statue of Christ, we receive what? The seal of God. Ephesians 4 verse 30. So step one is to be born and receive the love of God. Step two is growing in the love of God. Romans 5 5. And it's the last step is what? The sealing. Roman, uh, Ephesians 4 verse 30. We are sealed by the Holy Spirit. That's why those who are sealed by the Holy Spirit, they must experience the high level of the love of God. So when Paul experienced this, did Paul was born again? Yes. Did Paul grow in Christ? Yes. Did Paul was sealed? Yes. Did Paul experience the love of God? Much more. Where? Romans 8, verse 37 to 39. When he experienced the love of God so much, he said, nothing will separate me from the love of God. Amen. Where was that love of God? Where? In him, in the mind, because the mind is connected to heaven. And the love of God flow into you through the Holy Spirit. Because Romans 5, 5 says this. Romans 5, 5 says, And hope make not ashamed, because the love of God is shared abroad in our heart by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. So the Holy Spirit always brings the love of God. If you have the Spirit of God, you can't hate somebody. When you have the Spirit of God, you cannot be vindictive. You, have the Spirit of God, you can't be paying back. You can't, you, there are things you just cannot do it. But if you are very resentful, you are very full of the spirit of like hatred, envy, all of those things, it's a testimony that the Spirit of God is lacking. And if it's not the Spirit of God, there's another Spirit right there. If we got to cry to God, say, Lord, I need deliverance. Now, the Holy Spirit bringing the love of God in you. Now, Ephesians 4, verse 3, verse 30. In Ephesians 4, verse 30, as long as he's bringing the love of God, we will reach the very high level of that experience. He said, Ephesians 4, 30, and grieve not the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Now, we read in Romans 5.5 5, that the Holy Spirit brings what? The love of God in the heart. 
Now, who will seal you? The Holy Spirit. What does that mean? You must reach perfection of character. You must experience the love of God at the highest level. And that's why, if you look at Stephen, Act 5, Act 7, verse 55, let us know. He was filled with the Holy Spirit. Tell me how much of the love of God he have? All. Oh. Oh. And when he have that, he said, nothing not going to separate me from this. If you want to stone me, continue. Me, I am not losing this one. That connection is the only way of victory. Is the only way of victory, my brother and my sister. You can be lost in the church. I don't say don't go to church. But make sure you find your way and connect to heaven. Make sure your Christian life is alive. Make sure you are receiving strength from heaven. And this is called the mystery of godliness. And that will be the last thing God will do. And to have what? The 144,000 wrapped up. Revelation 10, verse 7. The last thing God will do for salvation is a finishing the mystery of godliness. Can you finish something you don't begin? Are you, are you experiencing God to begin His mystery in you? And that mystery is brought in you by the Holy Spirit. How do you experience that? By the love of God. You will see that anyone that experiences the love of God, he don't want to be separated from it. When Paul really get into the, the oneness of this love, he said, nothing will separate me from the love of God. My brother and my sister, what in your Christian life can keep you faithful? Is it the kind of job? Everything is peaceful, so you're okay? Is how many friends you have in the church that can keep you in the church? We are many people like that. We are kept by the number and the quality, the quantity and the quality of the friendship we have. It makes our Christian life very good. Every Sabbath we have a lot of fellowship. It's good. But are you fellowshiping with heaven too? Because that is the most important one. Now, the next... The next thing we will look at is uh, the tabernacle. Let's go to 2 Timothy. We will be running fast to close. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8. It says this, Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. A what? A crown of righteousness, <clears throat> which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day and not to me only but unto how many all. all them also that love his appearing I want you to get this picture very well here Paul is experiencing is getting the experience of tabernacle salvation he is not guessing. He's not saying, maybe I can be saved. Maybe Christ will have mercy on me. No, he's saying the crown is already reserved for him. So you remember the same Paul says, in, in the beginning, Passover, I am crucified. It's no longer me that live. In unleavened bread, he said, we must live by what? Sincerity and truth. In the first fruit, he said what? Romans 8, verse 11. If the spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwell in you, it will quicken your mortal body. Now, Pentecost, it tells us that the very spirit, right here in, uh, in John, John, 1 John 2, verse 11, it revealed to us we will have the very same spirit of Pentecost. You must experience that. Now, when you have the spirit of God, it must bring forth the fruit of the spirit. And they will naturally have trial to come. Because the enemy don't like to see those things come. And those trials represent what? Trumpet. When we are working with God, we must have the understanding of trial. Job do not understand everything, but he knew all of that is for his own good. Are we together? That Paul can tell you that the trial work of what? 
patient. And the patient do what? Work what? Perfection. You cannot reach perfection without trial. It's impossible. It is impossible to reach perfection without trial. And those trials are what? Trumpets. So when you have a problem, you need to know this is the trumpet. And Christ is going to do something for me. Are you getting it? Anytime you are in trial, Christ is one with you. When Stephen was a stone, he was alone. Heaven was connected. Can you get how much we are so important that you are suffering on earth? God give a command so that heaven can be opened. He can be looking at you and encouraging you, sustaining you by the Holy Spirit. Can you see God himself assisting you in your trial? How can you be discouraged? It's because we are losing the picture in the sanctuary. It's connected. It's like it is connected. It's so connected. We must get to that Christian life. Otherwise, the letter trial, instead of uh, letting go higher, we, now we start murmuring against God. What is the sin in the wilderness? Murmuring. Murmuring never helps. Prayer always helps. The time you will spend to murmur, spend the very time to pray. The time you will spend to call somebody to be saying, oh, Things are too bad for me. Pray. Because you know there's somebody in the most holy place only for you. We got to get to that atmosphere to see a living God doing something real for us, in us. And we must, by faith, claim those things. Trial. You see, the trial are made that God will lift us up and place us above the trial. You see, the three Hebrew boys, God could have just delivered them from the fire. But God chose not. He said, okay, I'm going to let you go into the fire, but I will raise you up and place you above the power of the fire. Next time you present fire, they will be afraid again? No. God wants us to, to, to submit to him. He will raise us and place us above the problem. But unfortunately, we say, Lord, I don't want any problem. How can we grow without that? My brother and my sister, we got to look at some stuff and see exactly what is going on. We remember the cause of sin, right? It's what? Misrepresenting the character of God. When sin is correct in somebody, when the sin is removed completely, and you are sealed by the Holy Spirit, what the Holy Spirit will bring in the heart? The love of God. And what will happen to you? You will say like Paul. I get it. Nothing, and nothing will not separate me from what? From the love of God. This is the only thing that can should sustain us in the church. This is the only thing that should sustain us in the trial. In fact, this is the only gospel for the last days. Because the last days, you're going to have what? All the trials to come. The natural disaster will come. Very soon, they're going to frozen every bank account. Yeah. Very soon, a lot of bad stuff will come. Yeah. But what, what is the only thing that should keep you? The love of God. Why? Why? Sin start right there, must finish right there. Mm. If God needs to finish the work of sin and destroy sin completely in you, it must be done, and the fullness of the love of God must be revealed in you. And when it's there, it becomes the most precious thing for you. Yeah. You can't let it go. It becomes the most precious thing. You say, listen, every angel come. Look at it. Paul. He said, even, even angel come to from heaven. He's not going to let go this one. <laughs> is it trial? Is it suffering? No matter what is going on, is it death? He's not going to let go. How much are you experiencing the love of God? When you are praying, do you believe that somebody really loves you listen to that prayer? Do you believe that when you are sleeping, your lovely father sent two angels to protect you so that when you raise up in the morning, you can say, glory be to God. Amen. My friend, if you are not acknowledging the love of God in your life and being satisfied by that love of God, you will be always miserable. We are many people, God protects us through the night. When we get up in the morning, the first thing is we take with ourselves our worries. But the first thing to do is to say, Lord, thank you for the night. Amen. 
And the Lord, I recommend the whole day to you again. Instead of doing that, oh no. Oh, what is the problem I have again? What I'm going to do today? How I'm going to fix this problem? You get up, the first thing you take upon yourself is what? Burden. And God said, the first thing you should do, recommit yourself to me. I will take care. I will take care. Are you ready to go through all the seven steps? Can you see that it is practical? It's tangible. Can you see that it is something we must experience in our life? Paul experienced that. Stephen experienced that. Job experienced that. Every Christian must experience that. Because the 144,000, they're experiencing that. They must. But the good news is, is the work of God. That's why he did something precious. We can read that in Hebrew. Hebrew chapter 1. Hebrew chapter 1. No, chapter 2, sorry, verse 11. Hebrew 2, 11, somebody can read it for us. Hebrew 2, 11. <clears throat> for both, how many? Both he that sanctify and they that are sanctified and they who are sanctified are all of one. For which cause is it? He is not ashamed to call them brethren. Can you see Christ calling you his brother, his sister? The anything he received, he want to share with you. Not only he want, he did it, he proved it. People already experienced that. Amen. All we need now in this study of living sanctuary yeah. is to step in to say, Lord, people experience this. And the plan of salvation, I am also included in it. Lord, I need to get through all of the seven steps. Father, I need you. Teach me how to go through it. And I recommend that everyone, we have the chart. Take time and read all the verse. And develop something personal to yourself. Because I haven't developed prayer through this. The seventh step of the prayer. When you start your prayer, first of all, let go your solution. Fully surrender to God. Pass over at the altar of, uh, the altar of, uh, for burning. After that, you got to be receiving the Spirit of God. The labor. After that, when you receive the Spirit, it must shine. Now you are with the candlestick. After that, you must base your prayer according to the Word of God. That is a shoe bread. After that, your prayer must be mixed with the incense, the grace of God. You must say, Lord, may your will, only your will be done. After that, you must get into the most holy place. For what? Your prayer must be sanctifying. Your, your purpose of prayer must be, just be focused, Lord, Lord, fix the problem for me. Fix the problem. God said, no, you are the problem. I need to fix you first. Okay. Now, he's saying here, in the second period, when you have the love of God in you, it's called the mystery of godliness. It's also called partaking what? Divine nature. This is what God wants to do for you and for me. God made a serious statement we read in the beginning. That unless the mind of God becomes the mind of man, anything, we are, anything else we are doing will be what? Lifeless, will be useless. Without the seven step, without the living connection to heaven, our Christian life is useless. I can be teaching this if myself I don't get into that connection. My Christian life, my ministry is useless. Imagine that we have a church where everyone learn to connect to heaven, receiving from heaven. Are you getting the picture? And those people, Christ, they are under Christ. And Christ under the Father. And they are walking together. And finishing the work. And destroying sin. And destroying all the work of the papacy. You see, when you get into this, you cannot be afraid of the Sunday law. No, you see, when you get this stuff right, you have your name in the book of life. Amen. In Revelation 13 verse 8, it says, Only the people who have their name in the book of life will not receive the mark of the beast. 
That means they must have their name in the book of, book of life prior to the crisis of the mark of the beast. Are you getting the point? They must be sealed right there. They must be in the book of life. And they will stand for God and will not receive the mark. We are so worried about the work of the papacy. No. We are so focused on the papacy. It's too much. We must be focused where? Heaven. And get what? Get all the mystery of God be fulfilled in us. Have our name still in the book of life. As soon as you have your name in the book of life, let the Satan play whatever he want to play. When the three Hebrew boys were sealed, they let Nebuchadnezzar do whatever they want to do. All we need, our name in the book of life. My brother and my sister, this is a very strong message. Obedience is not easy. And if I want to say it, it's impossible for carnal mind to obey God. All God is trying to tell us to look at the testimonies of the people who experience this. Like the disciple, like Paul, like all the Christians, like Stephen, like Job, they experience all of this. Like Enoch, if God is telling you, I have testimony right here. I have specimen right here. And I'm willing to do the same thing for you. Are you willing to take a decision tonight to get into the seventh step with God? God is saying he wants to do it for you and with you. All we need is to know, to believe, and submit, and he will do it for us. God wants to save us, my brother and my sister. It was painful for heaven to see Christ died. But he did it just for you and for me. I always say it's not a joke for the Son of God to accept to die. It's not a joke. It's because we are so precious for the Lord that he accepts to lay down his throne, his honor, his power, his everything, just to save us. Not only on the cross, right now he's continuing the same work. We should not miss the day of atonement experience. The same way the disciples on that day in the upper room, they were certain that Christ made a promise, they, it cannot be wrong. The same Christ, the same Christ that sent the Holy Spirit, on, to the disciples on the Pentecost. He's the same Christ. is in the most holy place right now. Every day, sending the Holy Spirit for our growth. And when we are growing, unto when it's needed to receive the last finishing touch of the little rain, we will experience that. And I want all to know, there will be no big church with little rain. It will be individual experience. Hello? You're not going to have the whole seven Adventist church and like on the upper room, the Holy Spirit fall upon. The Bible don't say it. The Spirit of Prophet don't say it. Sister Hoa said, you can see it will be falling upon people around you. But you will not discern it. You will not receive it. It's so personal. But the good news, I keep saying it. It is done orally. It's done orally. All we need is to believe it, to accept it, and allow God to do it for us. When Paul gets all of this right, he has peace. He has a situation in life. All he knows, as long as he has the love of God, he is okay. How much do you cherish the life? How much do you delight in God's blessings? We are many people, we spend time thinking about what we don't have, and we don't have time to enjoy what God already provided. We are many people thinking about what I don't have so much that I don't even enjoy the good health God is giving me. God will give you health. You are so worried about your problem and get the health destroyed. And we are accountable, you know that? If somebody gives you something precious and you destroy it that willingly, you must be accountable for that. Do you see in the Bible God say, worry about your problem? No. He said, bring it to me. God said, bring everything. No matter what is in your life. No matter what is the mess in your life. No matter what is, even if you ever kill in your life. Christ is saying, he paid the price for that. He is in the most holy place for that. No matter what is the dirty thing, the dirty laundry 
He is the purifier. And more than that, he made himself one with us. He, he understands sin. He was on earth. He feel it. He experienced it. And he have a victory on it and destroy sin in the flesh. He want to do the same thing for us. Are you willing to get into the living sanctuary? Amen. Are you willing to allow the, this mind, the only medium, to be connected to heaven and experience all the seven steps? Mm-hmm. May God bless you and keep your decision faithful. Amen. Amen. Now I'm going to pray to close. Divine Father, we want to thank you. Lord, I'm asking that you send out the Holy Spirit this time. The only true teacher who can give us the true understanding of your mysteries. Lord, I beg you, we don't want to leave this place the way we come. We want to be filled with your spirit. We want to receive the clear understanding of your provision. Lord, do the work of faith in us. As we are living this place, Lord, put in everyone's heart to claim the experience of Passover, to claim the experience of unliving bread, first fruit, Pentecost, trumpet, atonement, even get into the experience of tabernacle, where we can all say like Paul, the crown, the very crown of eternal life is reserved unto us. Father, help us to see how effective is the plan of salvation. How other people was already saved. When Christ was transfigured, Moses calmed down. This was a testimony. Elijah calmed down. This is a testimony that surely those who are in Christ, they will surely have salvation. Father, help us to stop doubting. And trust your mighty work of salvation. All of us we need this time, we did not ask. Bless us with all above our expectation, Lord. In the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. We will give a very few minutes for some quick question, if you have one. Do you have any question? <laughs> yes? No question. Okay. If you don't have any question, I have one question. Do we believe that God made a provision and he expects every one of us to get into the experience of tabernacle on earth before the second coming of Christ? Do we believe that? And that is the goal of the whole teaching. So let us strive to have the assurance of our salvation. So God bless you. Amen. Were we richly blessed? Amen. Yes, sir. I don't know about you, but I am persuaded yes, that there is nothing in this universe that can separate me from the love of my God. Amen. And I believe that that love will keep me even in the time of Jacob's trouble. Amen. Amen. Yes, sir. Uh, I would like to invite you again to join us Sunday at 4 o'clock p.m. sharp. At what time? 4 o'clock p.m. sharp. Amen? So we are going to Eastern Standard Time. Amen. And we are going to go deeper yet with the Spirit of God through his manservant, Brother M. L. Verlis. I'm excited. The school has been a blessing thus far. Yes, sir. And I believe the Lord is going to continue to bless as we continue to cooperate with him. At this time, we may consider ourselves dismissed.